Welcome to season two of Robbie Burns and Friends. This season is all about my brand new book, Digital Organization Tips for Music Teachers, which is first in the Prestissimo series, a series of technology tip books for music educators, published by Oxford University Press. Each episode, I will discuss one chapter of the book with an expert on that subject. For example, on the episode about note-taking, I will chat with a music education specialist who is an expert on note-taking. The goal of the podcast is to offer complimentary material, not simply a regurgitation of the content in the chapter being discussed. Think of these as kind of like a B-side of each chapter of the book, or even better yet, a counterpoint, complete with meta-discussion and even an extension of the ideas already in the book into new territory as provided by the experience of the guest. This week's guest is Kevin Eichenberg, member of 410 Media and the director and editor of my very own book trailer for Digital Organization Tips for Music Teachers. Today we're going to talk about organizing all the video in your life. So, yeah, so what do you have till like 11 or 10.30, you said? Yeah, 10.30-ish, 10.40-ish. That's good. Like, I I try to keep these really short and sweet, but I mm. often find them, like, I try to aim for like 40 to 45 minutes, but the past three have been an hour and 10 minutes. Gotcha. Um, but the, they've been they've been like really good. Like the guests have all been just saying really smart stuff. So I've right. Um, so do you like? Wh- I guess what is cool about this is that um, we go way back. Yeah. Um, back to I guess like my co- this was when I was a college student and was working with drumlines. But th- these were your late high school days in the yeah in the Marriotts. I- Ridge High School drumline. Yeah, I remember it. I remember it clearly. <laughs> so you and another um, another friend of yours who was actually a private student of mine. Um, you guys both went off to school. This is uh, this is Evan Chapman we're talking about. I'll I'll put his I'll link him in the show notes for this episode as well. Yeah. Um, and you guys sort of went like he studied percussion. You went and studied video, and then the two of you guys banded together and now you have uh a media like a film company yeah yep that's pretty much how it went down we both like i guess through high school i was uh i got interested in high in like late middle school and like film but i thought i wanted to compose music and then i i realized i was really bad at that (laughs) and so i kind of switched to because what I liked so much about it was being able to apply the music to the to the film, and I was like, I think I like that more than writing it. But I thought that I liked writing it, but it was really just that I liked messing with it. So that's kind of how I started. And but Evan and I were, you know, been best friends since uh, late elementary school, and so we were both drummers, and we'd always play together and stuff. And so uh, I got into film first, and then I started doing some. You know, filming him playing, filming other people playing, and then Evan kind of got into it too. And then, yeah, we both went off to different colleges. And uh, I I went to American University uh, in D.C. and I was studying film and music as well, but, but mostly film. And then Evan went to Indiana to study music. And we were both kind of doing the same thing, but just in different circles. And then uh, we were like, we should do this together because we are doing the same thing. <laughs> and we have the similar aesthetics and we work great together because we've been good friends for so long and done so many things together. And so it just seemed like a natural progression. And yeah, now we got our our thing, uh, 410 Media, um, based out of Philadelphia. And um, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. And you guys are like almost all the Facebook activity I see is like in the a lot of it is just in the percussion space. Like you guys are just filming so much new music composed for percussion ensemble. Yeah, it's, it's true. We kind of found this niche. Um, I mean, we're both really into contemporary classical music or whatever that means, you know, like a new music. Um, and so we, we, that's kind of where we had contacts was in, uh, with composers and with percussionists, because we were both percussionists that were in that field and they saw the stuff that we were filming and they wanted it as well. And so they kind of got into that. And at first it was like all percussionists and now it's still majority percussionists, but we're um, definitely branching out a bit because we're getting calls, not as much from the players anymore, but more from the composers now. Um, So, you know, our names kind of gotten to places that, you know, most composers don't just do percussion, uh, stuff so you know we might have filmed their their percussion piece first and then they realized they wanted it for their string quartet or they wanted it for something else and so now we've started doing that um 
a lot more, but we do a lot of percussion work, a lot of work with percussionists. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's especially fun to have you on to have this conversation because not only did you do, have you done lots of percussion videos, but you also shot and edited the video trailer for my book. Right. (laughs) Right. Which we're going to be talking about today. Um, Awesome. I'm really happy with how that turned out, by the way. Yeah, so was I. I thought it was, I thought it was tight. It was fun. It was great. Yeah. Well, so like this, basically each chapter of this book goes through a different type of media type that a music teacher interacts with as their job. And I try to demystify not so much the software that gets that type of data into your possession in the first place. Like I'm not talking about how to operate Final Cut Pro, but what, how to organize it and like implement it in a way that's sane and uh, organized so that it's not overwhelming to the job. Like a lot, and a lot of music teachers find themselves brushing up against a lot of data. I mean, really anyone who's a professional is gonna have to brush shoulders with technology at some point. And so some of these chapters are on, like one of them is on PDFs, like not even a musical type of content at all, just something that everybody who is good at their job has to know how to deal with. Um, so video is something that a lot of music teachers deal with, whether it's taking videos of our performances, Uh, or just like taking videos of our rehearsals to watch and refine and get better, or even doing some, a lot of teachers do video projects with their music classes. Like there's just a whole lot of different ways that audio, I'm sorry, that video gets onto a hard drive of a music teacher. And so what I wanted to pick your brain about a little bit today is how to organize that and kind of keep it sane in a way that is not overwhelming. Sure. And you're professional. You have a lot of raw video footage on your laptop, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. So, yeah. So I guess let me let me tell you like a little bit about my workflow and then I want you to like rip it apart and tell me how it's wrong <laughs> and how it should be better. Sure. So here's here's like where all like this is, these are just some of the examples of video sources that I I end up with in my profession. So I have um like lots of video of student performance like or and actually re- more like rehearsal would describe this kind of video like things that I just take so I can watch them or play them back for a student or even they might be formal assessments videos that are taken on sometimes my phone or my iPad but also usually on a handy recorder like a Q uh, like an H4 no H4 is the audio one what's the one I'm thinking of the Q3 like a little right. handheld recorder um, and then I've got stuff that I've taken on my DSLR that, which is typically only taken out for concerts and that stuff usually gets edited in iMovie or Final Cut Pro. Uh, then there's like entertainment stuff, like the, all the streaming services, all the ways you can like interact with um, programs that you want to show either show to a class or even just in the case of me, like just enjoy personally. And, and then you have stuff that's like taken sort of in the context of an event, like along the other photos in your camera roll, but it's video. And then there's stuff like YouTube. I mean, like the list just goes on and on and on. And I find that video more than any other, maybe even more than audio, is something where like I'm just, I have it in all these different places and I I don't know how to reconcile it into a manageable way where I can like edit it where I, where like use the tools to edit it that are best for the job, but also not having it live in eight places. So I don't know if that makes sense, but that's... That's the problem I'm seeking to solve yeah. the book. And I, and I ha- get, offer a lot of strategies that I think make a lot of sense for a music teacher, but I'm curious on the professional take. Sure. So, so our, our usual workflow, and it, it can vary a lot from project to project, but like, for instance, like if we're just going to go film uh, like a live performance or something, you know, like where all of our video is coming from, you know, say, say a two camera setup or a three camera setup, um, then we always, first off, we always store to external drives, um, obviously, because video is so huge. <laughs> right. So having like your, you know, computers can get clogged so easily just by uh, having all those different, you know, spots and different media sources and media types all in one computer, you know, on your laptop. It's very easy to get so overwhelmed. And I, I'm guilty of that, too. Um, honestly, Evan, um, you know, the other half, 410, is... Uh, before we started working together, his uh, internal um, organization system was far superior to mine. So I was like, I'm going to do what you do. So what we usually do is, um, I'll give you two examples. One where it's just like a normal um, 
like I said, like documentation sheet where you have three cameras or something. We'll, we'll import that footage into the computer. You know, usually it's just on SD cards. Um, and then we have a folder that's just a project folder for that project. And we, what we like to do is color code everything to make it a lot easier. So say uh, the project's not finished yet. We have the little, I, I guess they're called tags on, on Mac um, where you can like tag it a color. And so if it's not finished, we'll put it, tag it as red. Uh, so it'll have a red tag. So that way we can scroll through all of our projects and see what's finished, what's not finished. Um, and then in that folder, we'll have the three cameras separately. So we'll say, okay, this one was a wide, this one was Evan and he was manning this one and this one was Kevin and he was manning this one. So you just kind of have it that way. And that's, that's a pretty basic and simple thing. And then in addition to that, like you'll need the project folder um, for whatever application you're doing it. And I won't go too far into that because that's, you know, kind of, uh, maybe outside of the scope that you're looking for this, but even if you're just putting together like an iMovie thing or something, um, and I'll be honest, I don't know how iMovie works anymore because I think you used to be able to save like where the file would go, but now I think it just like saves it like how Pages does, where you it just saves everything all the time. Um, I don't know if iMovie's in that either way. Uh, yeah, it kind of does work that way. It's sort of you're right. They're sort of masking like the file. Uh, hierarchy that like they they use a lot of well okay so like in a logic project they sort of cover you can choose to see something like a folder with all the audio right. content unpackaged or you can see choose to look at it as just a package file which is a single gotcha. icon but iMovie takes it a step further you can't even really look at an iMovie project you just are only right. only when you're in iMovie can you see your right work. and that's not that I don't really like that, but I mean, it makes it very simple for people that are, don't need that much control. But either way, so we save the project. So let's say we're doing like a uh, live concert five and we'll just have the, the we edit in Adobe Premiere. So we'll have the Premiere Pro project in that same folder. So everything's just in that folder and it's marked red. So we know it's not done. But for instance, I'm working right now on a on a more of a straightforward music video. It's just a legit music video with uh, with a singer, um, singer songwriter. And in that music video, similar to your examples, there's like all these different kinds of media. So she wanted um, still frames. So she had some like still frames that she had captured that she really wanted to like mix into the footage. There was um, the footage that we shot together um, in a studio space that we went up to New York to shoot it in. There was there's an After Effects animated sequence that I put together that we did some projections with. So we had all these different things that we just kind of put into that folder. And so the same basic idea, we just have a project folder for that project. <clears throat> and then within it, we'll um, usually I'll color code the different kinds of media so I know like what's where. So if it's an After Effects sequence or, or a, um, an animation sequence, I'll color code it green or something, just so I know what every file is and it just doesn't look like a mass of files. Um, and I also don't keep them spread over because After Effects saves its stuff into a certain project in After Effects. And, um, you know, uh, when we download the stuff off our camera, that records to a specific spot somewhere else on the computer. And that can get a real pain because then if something moves and you reopen the project and it's not linked, if you don't know where everything is, it's just going to be a, this is a huge pain in the butt to go back through and relink all the media. And I know working with some people, you know, that are, you know, just doing this just to do this. And a lot of them were teachers, you know, and they'd like give me a text or something be like, oh, I, I did this thing. I can't everything's messed up now. I don't know what happened. And most of the time it's just because they moved a file without knowing it. And then the computer, when you reopen that project is looking in that same spot to find the project or to find the file and it's not there. So then it just, it just disconnects everything and gets very complicated. So I always just make a project folder, put everything in it. If there's different media sources or media, um, like locations or something, I just put them on the same thing and color code them. So I know, what kind of media type I'm working with um, and where it all is. And that way, if I need to move the project to another drive, I just click and drag the, the main folder and everything that I need goes with it. So that way, if I need to open it on another computer or open it on a Windows machine, um, you can just drag it, click it, and it all opens and links immediately. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That relinking media thing is like a really big hurdle for a lot of people who are yeah. like, who are like like if a teacher is in using iMovie to edit videos of their class or if they're u even using it in the class. Pe that's that thing like where you first break into something like Premiere Pro or Final Cut Pro. That very first time you see that screen where it's like a big giant red frame instead yeah. of the actual video. 
that can be pretty stressful. So you're, yeah. so it sounds like you're managing a lot of your raw footage in the, like just on the hard drive, like in the finder. Yes. Yes. We, um, we keep everything that we have. We, we played a little bit with, uh, like cloud based stuff, but, but it's our, the files that we work with are just so massive that it's, it's takes quite a long time to upload all that stuff. What so we just, yeah, we just deal in the finder. Yeah. What if, what if, uh, where do you put the stuff in the finder? Because, you know, recently, like, if you're using a Mac, recently, like, iCloud has these new features where... We, right. we, there are a lot of parallels to this conversation as last week. I did this with audio last week, and my guest actually teaches a film class. So we kind of... I tried mm -hmm. to not, like, get into this topic too much because I knew we were going to talk about it today. But he w had a lot of really strong opinions about this that I thought were really good. So, like, we... Like you are in the finder and you're putting your files there. Like one of the things we were talking about is how iCloud now syncs your desktop and your documents folder, which are two places where I think a lot of people leave their stuff. And, and that's great. Like if you have, if you pay for enough storage, but what iCloud will do and you can't control this in a granular way yet is they'll just start uploading your stuff to the cloud that it doesn't think you want on your hard drive. Yes. Yes. And, and you're trying to like, if you're trying to do a video project and you're sitting down to your like planning period as a teacher and the, one of the video files you need is now like in iCloud, you have to like sit there now and wait 10 minutes for it to download. Yes. Especially if it's like, you know, a six gigabyte piece of raw footage. So where, where are you keeping your stuff on the hard drive? Right. So yeah, that's a really frustrating, frustrating <laughs> feature that, that was added. I mean, it can be really handy for like, you know, your tiny little documents, you know, like yeah, then great. it's like, oh, right. great. But like, yeah. So for instance, when, um, like when we record in Logic, because we do, we do that as well. When we record the artists that we're working with, we, use, we always are recording into Logic. And so I have that on my MacBook. So I, I work when I have my, my editing machine is a Windows PC, but my, I'm work on a MacBook right now and I use my MacBook for pretty much uh, all the daily stuff and like recording audio and stuff like that. But so I kind of, we kind of had to make a file system that worked across platforms, across Windows and across, uh, across uh, Apple. And so you don't have that problem on a Windows machine, but on Apple you do. So Logic files, it's, since they're not as big as video files, a lot of the time we'll keep those on the internal hard drive. And I've had that happen where I have it and I, and, I, and I either make a little mental error and I forget that it saves it to the documents folder. And then I go to open the project and it's like all of the, you know, say like cello, say it's a string quartet or something uh, like and those are my stems in logic and it just uploaded all of those to the cloud and i'm like i open it and it's not there and i'm like god and you got to click and wait for it to download like an hour it's really frustrating so usually what we do is we just make a separate folder um that's not in either of those two <laughs> um folders and where do you put stuff like, though like eventually i have a feeling that on at least on mac os like they're going to, the music folder, the picture folder, the movie folder, like they're going to start uploading all that stuff to iCloud. Like wh where are you leaving right. stuff? So as of right now, we put our logic stuff into music. And then when we're done with it, we just offload it to an external hard drive. So if we need to reopen it again, um, I, we just kind of keep it that way. And then the music folder doesn't get uploaded. So it's not a problem. Um, but a lot of the times it'll, it'll save the, uh, I don't know why. I guess it's just a destination path on my logic. It'll save like the, the, the root stems to the documents folder. And it's like, no, it's not supposed to be there. Um, but the music folder, for, at least on my machine yet, <laughs> it doesn't upload those. So I keep it in the music folder. But I think what we're going to start doing, honestly, is just we have to record to usually record to an intern, the internal drive just because it's faster than using an external drive. And when you're recording, you want to make sure that you know, that's not going to be a problem with, with drive speed and you're going to get any dropped frames or anything um, or dropped, uh, you know, samples. And so we always just record internally and then usually offload it to another drive. So I think that's, that's probably what we're going to be doing much more from now on as everything on Apple computers gets sent to the cloud. Although I would hope they'd also start to give you the freedom to choose what not gets uploaded to the cloud. You, you can turn that feature off now. That's good. <laughs> yeah, the documents. And, and it's actually, it really is nice for... It is. So here's one of my dilemmas, and this is just a little bit, like, I guess, uh, not applicable to too many people, but I'll share it anyway. I, I keep a Mac Pro in my studio, and I have a MacBook, that, I, and I use the MacBook way more often. The Mac Pro is, like, 10 years old. But yeah. 
I do sometimes record these episodes on the Mac Pro because it's already set up with my audio interface. Right. And I like to work on the logic projects on the go. So what I do is I have a little Dropbox folder and I just leave the, the logic project files in the Dropbox folder and that works really well. The, yeah. The problem is that iCloud is good enough now that I'm thinking of just doing a free Dropbox account and dumping all my stuff into iCloud. The problem is that um, the Mac Pro it will not upgrade past El Capitan. Right. And Sierra, the next operating system, is the one that will do that iCloud like offloading thing. Like in other words, I want it to happen on my Mac Pro because I can't. My SSD on the Mac Pro is too small to have all the video, so I have right. to leave all my video projects and and audio projects in Dropbox so that I can continue to sync. Because you can put Dropbox. In a on an external hard drive, but you can't do that with iCloud yet. So like on the right. Mac, the Mac Pro desktop, I just have everything uh, in Dropbox, but the Dropbox folder is directed to one of my external hard drives. Anyway, long long story short, um, you know, I'm still working out a way to make that work. But what, what you're ex- describing is basically you're you're keeping stuff locally organized and you're tagging them using <coughs> the Mac tags. Now, how do you? I, I, this isn't something that I think a lot of music teachers are doing, but how do you get, how, do, how are you playing with Windows in this process? Yeah, so the benefit for us is that we use pretty much all Adobe stuff except for Logic, um, like, you know, Photoshop, Lightroom, um, Premiere, After Effects, Prelude, like we're using like the whole production suite basically. Um, and that works flawlessly from Mac to Windows, like flawlessly. The only thing, the only slight hiccup we have is the fonts are different on a Windows machine versus a Mac machine. So if you make titles on a Mac and you translate them, they're not going to be the same fonts on, on Windows. But other than that, it's it's completely seamless. Um, and I, I made the switch. I've been a Mac guy for the last like eight years. And then I made the switch just uh, about six months ago because just the power that you can get by building your own PC or, or that kind of thing. If you want to put the time into it, you know, cause there's stuff, some stuff you want to learn first before you do it, but I'm kind of, kind of a nerd in that way. So I was totally cool with doing that, but you can, you can get so much more raw power by just for so much less money I know. on the, on the windows <laughs> side. And it's not quite as clean, but to be honest, windows 10 is, is, is pretty nice. Um, I like Windows 10. But, I have a, I yeah. built a gaming PC like five years ago, and right. it's not really fast enough anymore to run anything. But I, Windows right. 10, I did install just to play around with it. It's very clean. Very clean. Very clean. Very easy. And so when we, like, for instance, Evan, we did this just on uh, a, an edit um, uh, maybe a month or two ago um, where we did the initial edit on Evan's MacBook. He has a MacBook. And so we just did, like, the piecing together the... Uh, of beginning to end, you know, and then we translated it at that from his computer to mine um, because we needed the power because we were doing a lot of slow speed up effects and his computer just couldn't keep up with it. We had to do some compositing on it to do some stuff and his computer just couldn't do it on the, on the MacBook. And so we just had to, based off our file structure, which is all in the same same project file. He just clicked and dragged it onto a hard drive. We literally walked across the room, plugged it into the Windows machine, and I just clicked the the Premiere project icon, and it opens up as if you just open it. There's no trans, it doesn't convert it to anything, it doesn't do a thing. And so um, it's super convenient. And so I don't do too much, the, I mean, the, the organizational structures are the same. The only thing that's not on, um, that doesn't translate is the tags that we put, like, you know, on, on the Mac side, but that doesn't, that's not a big deal. Um, but it's a it's pretty much the same. I mean, file structure is a little bit different because it gives you like the C drive, D drive, E drive, that kind of stuff, and it's not quite as it doesn't spoon feed you quite as much on as on the Mac side. But I mean, other than that, I, I don't really use that computer for much else. If I'm doing anything else, I'm usually on my Mac. But that com- the, the Windows machine is just so much more powerful. <laughs> right. So if you were like, and and I think of myself as sort of this in this term. Actually, we talked about this also on last week's episode. You know what the state, current state of the prosumer. Um, last week's yeah. guest thinks that that market is slowly dying, but um, I, I think for the for the purpose of this conversation, I would certainly put myself in that camp. Like I want more mm-hmm. than iMovie, um, right? But I, I don't. You know, I'm not going to do a lot of these intense video workflows that you have. So as a prosumer, and I and I think that any teacher who is a little bit mystified by video but who is using it is probably running into the same problem where I once I get to the 
how do I view and play this content? That's where things, especially on a Mac, get really hairy. And I'll, and I'll tell you why. This is like, I'm gonna tell you as many as of the places that you can store a video for viewing on a Mac as I can. I actually wrote these all down so I cannot forget any. This is, this is sure. so like once you have a finished video, whether it's some like a movie you own or whether it's a video that you produced, these are all the different ways you can like store it. Okay, so you can store it in the Finder and just simply watch it in QuickTime Player. That's option number one. Um, you can uh, bring it to i into iTunes. iTunes has a, a video player. It doesn't like sync the library over anything. Like it does, can't you know? Like my iTunes Music library can sync across my devices because I pay for iCloud Music library. But the video files are just local to whatever computer I, I import them into iTunes on. Um, you can on an on an i an iOS <coughs> device uh, up until like a few weeks ago. There's like a video app that's separate from iTunes. Um, they're gearing that a little bit more towards TV apps like Hulu and HBO now, but that right. used to be a place you could watch video. You can, there's a, there's a thing called iMovie Theater also, which is right. when you're in iMovie and you finish a project, you dump it into this little cloud area and then it syncs it across your devices. So like there's on the Apple TV, for example, there's an iMovie Theater app that'll just let me view all of my iMovie projects. Strangely, Final Cut Pro does not let you export to that same folder. Right. Um, I, I think I've covered them all. So, I, but yeah. that's, like, that's like four or five different ways to view a finished video. So, like, what are you, I, what are you usually using to, like, if you have, a, like, some of these professional projects, I'm sure you just dump the scraps once you're done. You just give the finished video to the client, and then you're done with it. Is that pretty accurate? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, yeah, we don't, we never we don't scrap anything for at least like a year or two after the project just to make sure in case anything comes back. And even then, usually we'll just try to hold on to everything as long as we can because you never know when a client might come back and be like, oh my gosh, this happened. And it's always good to be the hero when that happens. But um, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's a thing. I, I taught a like iMovie slash film for beginners class at this camp for like six years and that was uh, the, like the more that uh, iMovie got updated and stuff and and like i or um os 10 changed the more that became so uh, uh confusing because <laughs> they kept adding all these things and yeah you had the the iMovie theater and then it's it's i actually found it really hard to find a way to just export like an h264 mp4 file from iMovie like to a specific place just so i can click on it and drag it onto like a like a like a flash drive or something like I was like they're hiding it in like this right. deep thing it's weird. Oh, I forgot. And so, yeah, sorry, I forgot one. Photo, you can yeah. do videos in your camera roll too. But go right, on. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. There's it, so many places. And so for me, what we always do is we just export. And I think you can do this in iMovie where you like say that you're exporting it for YouTube or something, and then it exports it as a. I could I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it just exports it as an H.264 uh mp4 file which is just like a super easily readable um reasonably sized video file you know that's not going to be crazy big in terms of file size or anything like that and and playable and pretty much any um like video playing application but what we always do is we always we're always pretty much all, all of our projects are pretty much destined for you excuse me for youtube um and so we always are exporting h264 in as high of a bit rate as we can um and then we just export it from Premiere, and we make it a file, and we don't have to, we don't, we don't need, we don't mess with any of that iMovie stuff. We don't do any of that kind of thing, or, the, or putting it into iTunes, because I believe when you put it into iTunes, if you try to open it in iTunes, it makes a duplicate of that file and stores it in the iTunes folder. Um, at least this has happened to me a couple times where I'm just trying to open a file and it just makes another file in the iTunes folder. So that way, when you open iTunes, it can always find it, which if you're, you know, if it's a gigabyte file, that's automatically two gigabytes of the same video that makes, you know, so there's no real sense for that. I always just open in QuickTime because QuickTime looks pretty good and, and it, it's easy. And you, it, I so I always mess with QuickTime. I never like put it into camera roll or anything if you're trying to get it on your iphone or, or or like on a on an ipad then i'll just transfer it or sync it you know over that and sometimes then you have to do it through itunes to get it on there but i i, th I don't know if that answers your question exactly it, so it, it sounds like you're just generally speaking trying to keep stuff in the 
on the hard drive of the computer and view it in the folder yeah. as much as possible. And that makes a lot of sense. Now you can, yeah. this, this kind of eliminates the possibility of using any like fancy, pretty video apps. Like the iMovie Theater app on the Apple TV in theory is a very nice idea because it's yeah. like, it's built for a TV interface. So like the viewing and play, you know, it feels like using <coughs> a Netflix or something. Like it's just got nice big right. tappable buttons and it's all focused on the content no clicky buttons and options. The problem is, you know, that like what you just said, like all the the organizational issues that come up if you use something like an iMovie theater or an iTunes. So what I do to get around this is, and I'm a little bit redundant. Some, some of my stuff is in iTunes, but most of it is just in, like I said, it's in a Dropbox folder right? In where I can access it, watch, <coughs> watching it in QuickTime from the computer. But then what I do it, to add this extra layer of, watchability is I have a Plex, and this is all in the book, but I have a Plex server running on my uh, d desktop computer that's always <coughs> on, and it's just looking into that folder of video content, and it's just like basically creating a server where I, from any device anywhere in the world, I can just pull up one of those videos and watch it in a yeah. really nice video app. That's a good way to do it. That's a really good, we use Dropbox quite a bit as well. Um, for syncing stuff across multiple machines and also being able to access files wherever. Dropbox is, we use Dropbox a ton. And so that's definitely a convenient way of doing that as well. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's pretty good. It's the best thing I've come up with so far. Yeah, 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 that's a good, that's a good system. For, I mean, the, 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 we never, you know, we're never, you know, for, it, it's a slightly different file, or not file, but a slightly different system, yeah, for someone who's, you know, just, wanting to they just did a small little video and they just want to watch it on their tv and a lot of times those uh like the iMovie theater or the or the the iTV theater whatever it's called the apple tv theater um is more convenient you know for people that are more amateur you know that that just need like oh i just did this one video and i need to get that up there and and I regrettably don't know that much about those things because I never have to do that. Um, and so my advanced mind has been uh, numbed to the, not advanced mind, but the, you know, the advanced mindset of video. So I don't know exactly how those things work. <laughs> they're, just, they're just nice shells that sort of right. cover up, like, because the Finder is admittedly not a really friendly or fun way yeah. to play video. Like, it doesn't feel like a media player, but it sounds like, so, and the more I worked on this in preparation for writing the book, and the more I have talked to guests on this show about this thing, it seems like the sanest way to manage these problems is to just leave all of your content in on the hard drive of the computer where you have more control over it. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. That's, yeah, I mean, the, I think the cloud stuff is going to be really, it's great and super, super convenient. But like for stuff like, you know, big video files or like professional stuff, it, it's still not quite there yet. And it's hard to really manage it cleanly uh, when you're like, oh, wait, so what's on what's in the cloud right now? What do I need to redownload? What do I you know, how do I how do I do this? And so for us, it's just like I said before, it just makes it so much easier just to have one file per project. Um, or one folder per project and you just make sure that you save everything into that folder and then you know where it is, you know, like it's, it's just makes it so much easier than worrying about what's in the cloud, you know, what's, what's here, what's, what's in my movies folder, what's in my music folder, you know, like it's just like, I just make a folder and then if I have movies and music, I'll put a, a folder, subfolder and make that subfolder music, but I know that it's in the project that I need it to be in. <clears throat> yeah. Do you do you think like we've things like media playback like iTunes things like photos are all on the cloud now you know you can sync those right. those libraries across multiple devices and even you know like really um, basic entry level <coughs> software like GarageBand can sync a project across yeah. a Mac and, a, and an iPad now like do you do you think that and I asked last week's guest this too and I'll I'll tell you what he said after you answer but like do you do you see video pro video software workflows coming to a mobile environment like where you can have enough speed and uh, space to sync like raw footage pro like basically like just have an, an a, a premiere pro or a final cut pro project that lives in the cloud and syncs between multiple devices the the project yes like i could see because you know the raw files would be tough because 
so much of editing relies on the speed of the connection, you know? So like if, if I'm going to edit, uh, a video file on my MacBook, let's say, and I'm going to use a USB two drive off the side, the, the computer can only access the footage that's on the drive as fast as that USB two connection, which is not very fast. So as a result, if I'm playing back the footage and, uh, you know, as I say, I have four layers of video that I'm trying to watch through it's choppy as anything. Um, so the project file itself, which is simply just, you know, some, some digital ones and zeros that tell the computer to reference specific files, which are, it's a very small file, you know, like I had like an hour and a half video and the project file itself was like maybe five megabytes, you know, so like that's really easy, but the, but all that project file is doing is telling it to reference the terabyte and a half of footage that it needed to reference. So the project file could totally be in the cloud and, and you could totally work on that and, you know, have that project file and then go somewhere else and, and access it and from the cloud and edit that way. The, the biggest thing for, for video would be the speed that you'd be able to access that, let's say, 500 gigs of raw footage to make it work easily. I mean, you can do proxy stuff, but that gets pretty advanced, you know, making like smaller files that are just proxy files that then when you re-export it, then references the full res files. But that's like a very, like a pretty advanced workflow. So I, I guess eventually it would, but it would just really rely on connection speeds and internet speeds, you know, like I would love to be able to just take my laptop here and not have to bring any hard drives anywhere and be able to edit through the cloud, you know, some massive project on like my drive back in Philadelphia. Um, but it, it's just, I don't, it's not fast enough right now to be able to edit footage unless it's like iPhone footage where, you know, or like really small bit rate, small file size. But if you're editing anything that's even like you say, like for, for the prosumer market's kind of dying. And so cameras are, you know, like a, a $5,000 camera now you can use to shoot a, a, a big budget film, you know, so, and as a result, it makes really, really big files and really, really dense information packed files because the video footage is, is that high quality. And so at referencing, using anything like that is, would be really tough over the cloud uh, until, I don't know, internet speeds get super quick or you can always find a reliable internet speed. I, I, I don't know when it would happen, but I, it could definitely happen at some point, but uh, not quite yet. Yeah, that's more or less what we discussed last week. Yeah. Good answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. I don't want to hold you. You got to go, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, I probably got another couple minutes, but yeah, cool. another five minutes. So, like, is there anything you would recommend to <clears throat> a teacher who's just getting started with video? Um, maybe someone who is just about to break into. Like they they're using iMovie, but they wanna they want just some more slightly advanced features. Like what what are some things you would suggest to someone who's breaking into this area? Yeah, sure. So I mean, I don't personally use it, and I I I personally find it uh, frustrating to use, which is Final Cut 10. But I know that I only find it that way because I'm used to another way of editing. Um, but I've heard that a lot of people really uh, are able to get a lot of good things out of Final Cut 10 because it has a similar feeling to iMovie, but it has a lot more powerful features. And it, I guess it's $2.99, so I mean, it's not super cheap, but if anyone, you know, if someone was looking for something that was a bit more advanced than um, iMovie, Final Cut seems like a natural step up from that and gives you a lot of room to grow, because um, you can do a lot of powerful stuff in that, in that program. Um, but also cameras right now are, I mean, you can get, I mean, an iPhone shoots incredible video, you know, like it's not like you need to sink a lot of money into a camera to get fantastic results, you know. So, you know, if, if they're really interested in, in having, you know, getting high quality video or, or that kind of thing, you know, you can, the DSLRs now shoot amazing video um, and also pictures so you can kill two birds with one stone. And then Final Cut 10 at only two ninety nine is a, really yeah. intense program that can get you a lot done. And, and for someone that's just going to do it off and on, it might be a better investment than doing like Premiere Pro, which is a subscription based model. So like, you know, it's for the whole suite is $50 a month, but I think you can get like single app for $10 a month. But you know, after a couple of years, that's gonna, 
equal the same the, amount that the, you pay for Final Cut. Yeah, the Apple Pro stuff, actually. There's a teacher discount going on right now. I think it's oh, for teachers great. and students. You can get all of their Pro stuff. Like, I'm talking about Logic, Final Cut Pro, Compressor, Main Stage, all of it for 200 bucks. Oh, that's great. Yeah, so that's, that's kind a of, great deal. A, it's just a steal. Like, I mean, Logic yeah. itself is 200 bucks. And Logic, yeah, and I, I still use Logic. I, Logic is fantastic. And, and like I said, Final Cut's not a bad program. I just don't use it because I'm not used to it. It's a very different uh, editing style. And so, or editing, it just kind of changed the way that people were editing before that. And a lot of people that were already had learned on a different way were really, really pissed off about it. And so I wasn't angry about it. I was just like, well, I, I can't do this and I need to finish this project by next week. So I'm not going to upgrade to this. I'm just going to switch to Premiere. And so that's what I did. But um, for someone that doesn't have that, those things ingrained already in their, in their brain, Final Cut is a, is a really powerful program. Yeah, I agree. It's what I use. It's a nice sweet spot for someone who doesn't want to get buried in buttons and features, but who wants, I mean, and I, I honestly, like if there's one feature that I really use it for a lot, and that's just to take the, the video of my DSLR and the audio of my microphone and sync them together using right. the audio timeline. And that honestly, like if iMovie had that feature, I might use iMovie all the time. Like it's right. really, Oh, and, and chapter support. I use chapter support often mm. in final cut, but I'm not nearly advanced enough that I need much more than just a couple. Right. Features. Well, and that's the benefit of final cut is that it is like price wise, uh, you know, not, not crazy. And also, you know, if you only need like these couple more powerful features, it's right there for you. And it's not gonna, you're not going to be like jumping into this deep end because it's pretty familiar from iMovie. Um, but you're also not throwing money away on all like these powerful features you're never going to use, you know, and they're there if you need them in the future. Yeah. You can always, you can always grow. There's, there's plenty of headroom with software like Mm -hmm. this. Yeah, definitely, definitely. But yeah, I mean, like I said, cameras now are, you can get an amazing camera for less than $500 and, you know, that can shoot incredible video and and you can do an incredible editing job on on Final Cut and that's, you know, you've output maybe $600 and you have a very good workflow. I'm glad you bring this up. I'm actually in a position right now where my DSLR is just a little bit quite not enough for what I want to do when I'm like filming a concert. (coughs) For mm-hmm. someone like me, and I have a Canon 60, an EOS 60D, which is, you'd call that prosumer, right? Like, it's kind of a... Like, sure, it's a good camera. Yeah, yeah, it's a pretty solid camera. Um, so, what what is the, like, what is a comparable video camera? Because, and, and I actually love the way that the Canon shoots video, but it has, the software has this 12 or 13 minute or so video limit where it's like... Yes. They want you to buy their video camera, so they... Yes. Ch- chop yes. off the video at the 12 minute mark. What, what uh, is like a good camera for what I would call the prosumer, someone who's like, who doesn't want the bare, the basic level thing, but also doesn't need pro equipment. Sure. So I guess there's a slight gap between that. There's a slight gap, not a large one, just a slight gap where, you know, like the cameras that we use are Canon C100s, which when we bought them were when I bought mine like five years ago, it was like $6,000, but now you can buy one for, I think like $1,700 and it's only going to go down in price because more stuff keeps coming out, but it's a solid camera, but that's, you know, that's a bit, a bit much. Um, but underneath that Canon has, I prefer, I like Canon, but a lot of people, you know, want to use something else and that's totally great too. There's a lot of options on the Sony side, the Panasonic side. Um, but I know that, um, Canon has, you know, they have like their C line, which is the cinema line, which is the, C1, the C100, C200 soon, 300, and then the 500 and 700. And, you know, 700 is like the $35,000 big camera they shoot major motion pictures with. Um, and the C100 is the littlest of the line. Um, and that's the one that we have. And then underneath that, you, ha- you know, you have all the DSLRs in between, which are mostly photos. And then underneath that, like something that I don't know too much about anymore um, what is like the camcorders, you know, that are like, prosumer ish not really prosumer but more like consumer because no pro is going to use them but they take a lot of the similar feeling and and color science and stuff from the cinema line which is their you know their cinema series um and puts it into like a smaller thing that then also is able to film for longer than 13 to 15 minutes because that's super annoying with the dslr now the only thing you lose and i don't know if, if people would care about this but the only thing you lose with using camcorders 
um, versus DSLRs or those cinema series cameras is that the sensor is significantly smaller. And since the sensor is so small, you lose that really nice film look that you get with DSLRs. Usually you lose the ability to interchange lenses, which means that you don't like, let's say you're filming me and the background would be out of focus, you know, so it gives that look of, of cinema and of, of authentic movie um, that was missing from video cameras, you know, until the Canon DSLR revolution that kind of happened in like 2008. Um, where they put video camera capabilities into the DSLRs, and that's kind of what started this whole video camera frenzy that everyone's been on since then. And so those camcorders, you lose that ability to have that. But for someone that's not looking to film stuff that looks like that, and they literally just want to be able to set up a camera in the back of you know the auditorium and film the band concert, the camcorder lines you know that had that Canon has that don't do pictures but just do video are really quite fantastic um, and take really high quality video. A lot of them in 4K, not that you need 4K, but you could if you wanted to have it there. Um, they take really good pictures and are really good, really good images. And, you know, you can scale as high or as low as you want in terms of price. You know, you can get stuff for $800. It's going to look fantastic. You can probably get something for $250, $300 that's going to work perfectly for you um, and still look really good. Cameras are, are just getting really nice now. <laughs> And you you don't need to break the bank for it at all. Yeah, I think there's a strong reason to have a camera. I really do. I don't yeah. think there's a strong reason to have a low-end <clears throat> DSLR camera, but what I right. have and above is really does like and and you can like and f the phone cameras are insane. Like the new they're I insanely have, good. Yeah, the por the portrait mode on my iPhone seven is flawed, but when it gets a really good picture and it like it senses correctly like the depth of field and. Oh, yeah. simulates that i get really amazing shots and you know the, but still if i put if i go on vacation and i'm taking a mixture of pictures on a dslr and on a personal phone and you put those up, both up on the big tv to show like a family yeah. the slideshow it's very it's very much still clear by a very long much. shot like what like yeah. like a picture of some mountains you know like thousands of feet of mountains <laughs> you know you you see the de the detail and the lighting and in the in, you know, in the definition of the DSLR photos, that is just not quite there in the phone. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's it's definitely true. And this that might be the last thing I have to say on it. But I just bought a uh, like a little mirrorless camera, like a little mirrorless Sony camera that uh, we were just looking because all of our publicity and stuff is basically social media and uh, Instagram and stuff. That's pretty much how 410 gets its gigs. And so you know, we just been using phone cameras, but we were like, you know, we should really get like a little mirrorless camera that we can just like snap quick pics. And so I just wanted one for myself. <clears throat> so I got a little Sony A5100. That's, I don't have it here with me. It's, it's upstairs, but it's literally like small, maybe slightly smaller than an iPhone. And it's like this thick, you know, and you can interchange the lenses and but it's like this big and it takes absolutely insane pictures. And since it's mirrorless, there's no mirror in there. So you don't need a big chunky DSLR, but it, it's the same sensor that you get on something like this big. And it's got like Wi-Fi in it, all that stuff. So you can easily transfer it to your phone and post up to Instagram and stuff. So just kind of can bring up your Instagram game. Not that that matters that much, but, um, you know, for us, a, 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 pic, a picture, a moving picture company, it's important to make sure our Instagram also looks the part. Yeah. <laughs> so. So we do that, and it, it takes fantastic pictures. And, it, and and now I just take it with me everywhere you go, hang out with friends. You can just snap amazing pics. Um, That's the Sony and A, A5100. The A5100, I think that was four, uh, 450, maybe slightly less. But you can get ones beneath it that are the same sensor. And it did just take amazing pictures. And the video is amazing, too, but they're just fantastic little cameras. Get cameras are they're just it's pretty exciting time to be in the camera world. That's awesome. All right. Well, I don't want to hold you up, but I... No, it's good. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate you coming on today. This has been fun. And uh, Yeah, no problem. And, uh, you know, if, if you need more or something at some point, uh, feel free to let me know. I'd be happy to pop back on again. All right. And I'll make sure in the, in the show notes you can... Everyone can read all about you, find out where to find you. Are you on Twitter? We're actually not on Twitter, but we're on Instagram and Facebook and pretty right. much everything else. I'll link those pages to the session notes. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Cool. Thanks, Thanks Robbie. Yeah, this has been fun. I'll let you know when it posts. Yeah, sounds great. Um, and I'm sure I'll talk to you soon. All right, and I'll talk to you soon. See ya. All right, see you later. <laughs>